Hi, everyone. Hello, and welcome to the conference on Asian Pacific American Leadership, Whew. also Kapa for short, Washington Leadership Program. My name is Toqueen Doan. My pronouns are she, hers, and I'm calling in from Lenape Territory, which is now known as the Philadelphia area. I have the honor to share space with you all today as a member of Kapal's Board of Directors. I'm so excited for us to get started, but before we do, I wanna share a little bit more about Kapal and go over some minor housekeeping. Kapal is a nonprofit that cultivates Asian American, Native Hawaiian, and Pacific Islander public service leaders by providing professional experiences and growth opportunities through our annual public service scholarship and internship program, as well as our roundtable series, mentorship, and tonight's Washington Leadership Program, also known as WLP for short. WLP is one of our signature free programs that introduces students to AA and HBI leaders in public service who can inform and inspire students' own civic engagement. For the first time in Kampal history, the summer's WLP series planning was led by a group of our recent scholars and intern alumni. As a reminder, all WLP sessions are recorded and live streamed to our Facebook page and will be available for later viewing afterwards, including the materials for this presentation. We'll proceed with today's session, Grassroots Activism and AA and HPI Identity. This session will focus on local movements and initiatives from the AA and HPI community to create change and directly impact communities across the US. Topics of discussion include identity building, community outreach, and empowering oneself to take the first step to make an impact. Attendees will learn about the tools to which to indicate calls to action, tap into network, and leverage one's personal passion and experiences as a means to uplift those around them. Panelists will respond to audience Q&A at the end. Please follow and join our conversation tonight on social media using the hashtag WeAreKapal. Thank you to our speakers and panelists this evening for spending their time with us and to all of you for joining us. And a very special thank you to our 2022 sponsors for making programs like tonight possible at Kapal. Now the moment we're all waiting for, please give a warm welcome to June I. Kim, who will be our moderator for this panel. June served as Associate Vice President of External Affairs for Comcast Corporation. In this role, he is responsible for building partnerships with Asian Pacific Islander, American community groups, and left of center National Party advocacy organizations. Prior to joining Comcast in 2021, June spent 21 years advising center left political parties, advocacy campaigns, labor unions, and corporations in Australia, New Zealand, Europe, and the US. June, over to you. Hey, thanks, Toqueen. Um, I am very excited to be here tonight, um, joined by uh, my fellow speakers. Um, I was actually uh, just reminiscing about the fact that, um, I guess, 20, 22 years ago, 21 years ago, um, I used to attend the Washington Leadership Program, um, not only for the free food, but uh, um, also to meet all the speakers. Uh, and that actually led me into working in politics. Um, and I will kick it off to Jasmine Stoughton from Progressive Policy Institute to kind of uh, say her introductions. Hi everyone. My name is Jasmine Stoughton and I currently lead the Mosaic Economic Project at the Progressive Policy Institute where we work to empower women um, to learn how to engage with the media and lawmakers to influence policy. Um, before that, I came from an organizing background, um, particularly doing grassroots organizing on state local, um, uh, an array of state and local campaigns. And I also worked at the Texas legislature um, during the 85th legislative session. So I'll go ahead and pass it off to Nadia to introduce herself. 
Yeah, thank you so much. Really great to be with you all today. Um, I wish that this is something that I had been a little bit more in tune with um, when I was in college, because I think uh, being part of the API community is something that I was really hungry for. So to know that there's a network out there to plug into early on, and those are your colleagues that you will eventually have in the future. Um, I wish I would have done a little bit more research for myself about Kapal, but really happy to be here with you all today. Um, my name is Nadia Belkin. I'm the executive director of the Asian American Power Network. Um, we are a national network um, um, fueled by state-based AAPI, Asian American organi organizations that are building power in their communities year round. And so we're really um, a clearinghouse for a lot of strategy um, and future planning for harnessing the AAPI vote, both um, through base building efforts and electoral work. Um, I come to this space uh, having worked on hard side campaigns, so campaigns for candidates, um, doing grassroots organizing, and now I'm really excited to be parlaying those skill sets into building power for the AAPI community community. Um, I've worked both in states and at the national level, um, so really glad to be on this call with my colleagues, um, and I'm looking to learning from you all as well. Um, I will turn it over to James. Tag, you're it. Of course you would call me, Nadia. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm James Chan, he, him, his, um, and I'm the uh, API Civic Engagement Director at SCIU. We are a, a union of more than 2 million members across the country and across the globe of service employees. That includes nurses, healthcare workers, janitors, um, airport workers, childcare workers, you name it. Um, we represent more than 2 million workers across the globe. Um, and prior to coming to SCIU, I worked in Florida politics and legislative advocacy advocacy space in Florida working with BIPOC communities to make sure uh, their voices are heard. And I'll pass it off to Eric. Thank you so much, James. And hello, everyone. My name is Eric Jang. Uh, he, him, his. I am the Deputy Director for One API in Nevada. It's a 51C4 state-based organization. I have another hat. I'm the uh, Director of Outreach for Asian Community Development Council, also based in Nevada. Come to you from Reno. I also have offices in Las Vegas. Uh, before I come into this work, like June, but a little bit less years, 10 years ago, I was checking my email just now. 10 years ago, I was part of the Kapal uh, when I was an intern. So I definitely got a lot of free food, uh, a lot of career advice, uh, a career fair. So really appreciate the, the help. And I really hope the folks that attending today in 10 years can also have as exciting of a, of a, of a, of experience that I get to have. So before coming to Nevada, I have worked on the Hill. I have worked for the administration. I've worked in politics through both campaign side and on the PAC side. Uh, also worked in startup and tech and also private equity and finance. But I really found my passion working in state-based organization uh, doing Asian American Pacific Islander outreach and both community organizing, political organizing. I'm uh, very excited to share more uh, in, in today's session. Next, I want to pass it on to uh, Mohan then. Hey folks. Um, by the way, I'm just so impressed by Eric actually holding on to an email for 10 years because uh, I don't know anyone else who's managed to do that. Uh, my name is Mohan Seishadri. I'm the executive director of the Asian Pacific Islander Political Alliance. We're Pennsylvania's first and only uh, statewide pan-Asian base building polit uh, political organization. We publicly launched in 2020 after a couple of years of back, back end development by multiple Asian community organizations across the state coming together to build a political home for our people. And I'm also the co-chair of uh, the Asian American Power Network. I came up running political work for Planned Parenthood, smacking down abortion bans and electing pro-choice politicians across the country. Um, but it feels really good to have come home to our people and to get to spend every day building power for our communities. And now I'm gonna pass it over to Peter. Thanks, Mohan. And thank you to Hannah and Kapal for uh, hosting this event and June. Looking forward to some great moderating questions and for some great uh, answers from the other panelists. Hello, everyone who's hopping on the call. My name is Peter Lee Hamilton. I'm the chair and founder of Young Asian Pacific American Leaders. YAPAL is a national um, organization that's focused on providing APA students and early career professionals with the resources they need and the fellowship that they can find that will allow them to develop into leaders of the future in civic, business, academic, and really all spheres of society. 
Uh, it's folks from a bunch of different backgrounds and, and, and histories. And our, our goal is to build fellowship and community around the conservative American values of individualism, personal responsibility, limited government, free markets, and patriotism. So a little bit of a different focus than I think some of the other groups on this call, I'm sure we'll have plenty to talk about, but I'm glad that we're all here advocating for the community and then building spaces where we can come together and collaborate. Hello, Jim. After Hi, after Andrea. after almost three years, I still don't know where the unmute button is. Um, so, thanks for uh, those great uh, um, introductions, guys. And I think uh, the way that I would like to do this is just kind of uh, have an open conversation and dialogue. Um, I know it's hard when we're all on video, but please uh, chime in. So, the first question I asked to have of you guys, because all of you guys are um, spread out throughout the country. Um, come from various backgrounds and various experiences, but what led you guys towards grassroots work and grassroots activism? And if you guys don't start talking, I'm just gonna call on you. Peter, you're up. <laughs> yeah, sure, happy to, June. I, I, for me, it really came from um, just a lack of, uh, infrastructure, right? As a community, we're much younger than a lot of the different uh, organizing communities in, in some senses. And so when I was looking specifically, I actually remember when I was an intern and I went to a lot of the events in DC that were hosted by Kapal and APEX and my organization that was my first entry was the Council of Korean Americans. And those were all great organizations that are doing important work. And there were, for me as a conservative, there were a lot of organizations that were left-leaning or left-focused that existed to help their exist community. And I think, I personally think that it's important to have representation across the fields. And when you're doing that, you want to look at who's in the room, who's participating in those conversations. And there wasn't really an opportunity for conservative Asian Americans to communicate with one another, build a community, and to potentially advocate for community specific interests. And so when I was looking at that, I was like, okay, where does this organization exist? There was an organization that existed, but that had gone dormant for one reason or another. And I said, I started reaching out to folks who were active in the community, who were leaders, and they were served specifically in the previous administration's uh, White House initiative on AAPIs. And I said, like, can we start this type of organization? And one of them said to me, you know, go find five of your friends and start something and I'll support it as much as I can. And that was it. I just went out, found a group of friends. We started putting on Zoom panels, having conversations about politics and the community and what it means to be at the unique Venn diagram where uh, people of my background are. And once we started doing that, it just naturally grew. And from there, it was powerful to see the impact it had on building community. When folks say, you know, I've really been looking for a community to come together and share these stories and have these conversations and, and pursue these opportunities and build these resources, that really inspired me to keep growing the organization and to continue building that community. Thank you, Peter. Oh, we lost Nadia. Uh... Well, one of the things that Peter mentioned is infrastructure, and I know, uh, um, you know, having worked in politics for 21 years, um, there there wasn't a, a lot of infrastructure, whether it's, uh, um, like Peter mentioned, uh, um, on the right or the left, right? Um, and I don't want to get into politics of, of any of this, uh, seeing as how Kapal is a C3, but um, there is this lack of actual investment in our community, right? Um, we do have a lot of great national organizations. We do have a lot of great um, leadership in our community, especially in Washington, DC, but, um, or in you know, uh, areas with a high concentration of Asian Americans, but in places um, like Florida, for example, you know, where Asian Americans make up a very small population, um, there wasn't any infrastructure and maybe James can kind of speak to his work in the state, but also uh, what you are doing currently with SEIU and helping build infrastructure. That's a nice way of you to call on me, June. Um, so yeah, so um, about a year ago, um, I was on a panel um, talking about the AP, API, API vote and why it matters um, in a state like Florida and Texas, right? And 
Um, as it, I don't think anyone would be surprised to know that a lot of APIs are moving from the West Coast up north um, to the Southeast, right? And that's a that's an increasing trend, and we see that. Um, here in Florida, where I live, right here in Orlando, for example, HMART is building a whole new HMART, probably one of the largest, if not the largest, HMART in the country because there's so much opportunity here, right? And there are a lot of APIs moving to the state of Florida um, and a state where, um, you know, Democrats are consistently losing statewide by maybe only 60,000 votes, which is only 1%. Like APIs could literally make up that, be that margin of victory, right? And so I actually reached out to someone I was working with um, at my last job who connected me with June um, to talk about how do we organize APIs and how do we activate API voters in a C4 way? Um, and there's, you know, as, as the third largest state, you would think that there would be an API organization statewide and there isn't um, that, that reaches across the Asian American community, right? And there's only one, um, maybe one C4 that does a very targeted outreach. Um, and we we need more of that infrastructure building. So what does that mean? That means raising the money to be able to hire the right organizers to continue capacity building. Anybody else? <laughs> Oh, I guess not. So moving on to the next question, um, you know, we have talked about the need for diverse voices. Um, and Jasmine, I know you work uh, um, in a in a specific field uh, and now working in public policy, um, trying to create those diverse voices. Uh, can you talk a little bit about how that fits in with grassroots and um, advocacy for the API community and communities of color in general? Yeah, absolutely. So specifically, like I said earlier, I work with women and mostly women of color. Um, and these are experts from across the country who want to engage in policymaking um, and how it intersects with grassroots organizing. I mean, on a lot of in a lot of ways, I think, first of all, like going back to when I was organizing on the grassroots level, it was so important to me personally to see people of color at all levels. Um, I think that when you're running a campaign and everyone is of one race or ethnicity, you inevitably have a very hard time tapping into certain voting blocks in certain communities. There's a lot of trust that is, is impossible to build if you don't have people from a, a wide array, array of backgrounds. Um, so for me, anytime I was running a campaign, it was super important to me to make sure that we were covering all of our bases, not only because I think diversity and building a diverse team is important, but I think that it is the only effective way to lead a, a, a strong campaign is to be able to have people who can speak to communities that they were raised in or that they grew up in um, and connect with them on a really deep level. So for me, it was very important to make sure that as I was coalition building or as I was building a campaign, we had really, really diverse voices. And now working in policy and seeing how many women and people of color are um, quoted in the media or testifying before Congress, I mean, unsurprisingly, it's, it's dominated by white men. And I think that that is, is really harmful in, in enacting our policies that reflect you know, the richness of our society. Um, so back to your question, I mean, I think that like, making sure that we can get people of power or people in power who are of all racial backgrounds is super important, but also stepping up and being that leader when, when no one else is willing to. Um, it's very hard when you're the only one who looks the way you do in a room. Um, on every campaign, when I've been a leader, my bosses have been white men and the people that I'm in charge of have been white men. And that's really challenging, but I think that it takes a lot of courage um, and someone needs to do it. So I think that having more folks step up and take those roles, even though it is hard, um, that's kind of what we're working to do at Mosaic is build an infrastructure, going back to that theme, but building an infrastructure of support so you have resources um, because it can be challenging to be the only one who looks like you uh, in an organizing space or in a policy space. Oh, that's great. I mean, I like I said, I spent 21 years working in politics and. You know, one of the big things I think um, to kind of to kind of piggyback off what you were saying was 
the biggest thing that all of us can do is actually just show up, right? Like Peter, Peter also mentioned it, like um, being in these spaces, um, trying to bring those diverse voices. Like if we don't actually show up, like we're not represented. Um, and, you know, unlike you guys where there are like one, two, three, four, five, six of you who are of, of the same age range and generation, like literally I could count on one hand the number of Asian Americans, at least on the left. Well, and probably the right, because I know most of the Republicans too, um, that worked um, in this space. So um, speaking of that, like, what, like being a part of the, Asian American, Native Hawaiian, Pacific Islander community, like what does that mean to you and how does that like translate um, into uh, bringing your authentic self and identity into politics? Um, Eric, you live in a really diverse place and I know uh, um, you came here at uh, for college, right? And yet now you're involved in politics. Yeah, I think like uh, probably many of you, uh, I went to college in, in the Midwest. I was a poli sci major, caught the bug and took my uh, school semester in DC, summer in DC program. Got a scholarship out here. I went to Wisconsin. Uh, it's a great school, but it's very white. And then I came out here, I wanted to find, uh, this is the first time I'm learning about, I learned about Asian American organizing, all this different organization that y'all in DC now uh, have the resources for. I learned that from watching, this was 10 years ago, Jeremy Lin, like Lin Sanity highlights on YouTube videos that recommend other YouTube videos and I learned about all the other Asian American work. So for me, like I always say Jeremy Lin in 2010, uh, 2011 at that time, I think Lin Sanity was 20, 2012, it's like 10 years ago. And then got me thinking, what can I do as an Asian American as a young person trying to get into politics and understanding the impact that we can have and not feeling a lot of time, especially now, well, the circumstances, a lot of time it's easy to be hopelessness, to feel that hopelessness, to feel that helplessness. Uh, there's a polling that just came out from his strategies group last week saying that Asian American youth have, I think across racial ethnicity group, the younger generation, our generation, your generation feel there's a lot of hopelessness or help, helplessness looking at everything that's happening. Doing grassroots advocacy, doing grassroots identity, being able to not only talk to my peers, now I'm mentoring folks as in college in Nevada, now I'm talking to the uncles and aunties in my community, make me feel like not only I'm doing a job, You'll probably heard of that a lot, the Venn diagram of three things, job that you can be good at, jobs you love to do, and jobs that there's a market for. And I think that speaks to a lot of us that's here, that not only, I've done the, the startup, that's really great. I've been in the, the private equity space where people, the word money is no issue, people just buy your soul. And in the end of the day, we want a little bit more than that. And I think this is the, the job that that is fulfilling because every day, especially during the pandemic, especially at the rise of anti-Asian hate, I know I wake up, I know there's 10, 12 different ways that I, the work I do directly impact and improve the communities I serve. And waking up to that and going to sleep with that, I think that's the best thing. I still can't believe I get paid to do this job. So I'm just here sharing uh, the, the kind of grassroots thing. At DC is fun. I did that route. But as soon as I start working in my communities, finding my way to connect. Uh, really, it's a, it's a good serotonin boost, I guess. That's the self-interest part. So, <coughs> so question Kim. for all of you, raise your hands if your parents actually know what you do for a living. <laughs> like my understand to, what you do for a living. <laughs> I got my parents to run uh, my Canvas program in 2016. Uh, and now my mom hits me up once every day being like, all right, when are you going to start phone banking? I'm bored. Um, so kind of an outlier, but really proud of them. Yeah. I mean, the, the, the reason about, like doing ballot guides for our family, like, Hey, here's what's on the ballot. Here are the people, here's what all of this means. So we're kind of translators now. Um, but yeah, if you ask them to break it down, they're like, they do great work and they're in the community and they're like, 
helping our voters. And I'm like, in a nutshell, yeah, that's right. But I think, Eric, a lot of the points that you brought up are exactly spot on. And I think that part of this work is also our community needs an invitation to participate. And so if we can be those, those um, conduits to the information, like access to information, information in language, I think some of those barriers that have kept us out of, out of this space, we are uniquely equipped to um, design program and get creative around. So going back to the way like my grandmother and my mom thinks about the work, they're very proud because they know that when there is a question about policy or democracy, they now have like a, a, an access point and like somewhere to go to ask those questions. And I think that long term is really like what is also exciting about this work, at least from my perspective. Yeah. And like, the, you know, some of us, we have worked for the largest, most powerful progressive organizations in the country. And now we do this because there isn't anything like coming home to your people. There isn't anything like getting to spend every day knowing that your colleagues and your coworkers and your comrades understand what you've been through, understand your experiences and are going to show up for you and throw down for you no matter what. And that together you can build a state, a country, a future that works specifically for your people, for your families, for the people you grew up with. Um, and I just wanted to echo everything Nadia and Eric said around like this, this feels so good. You get to, you, you wake up every day feeling good, even in the face of constant attacks from the right on our healthcare, on our rights, on our ability to survive in this country, um, because you know that you're serving your people in a way that you could never otherwise. Also, and I can't stress this enough, y'all know this, our food is better than everyone else's. Um, and all of the aunties are always like, oh, you're too thin, please have 15 dosas. Um, and you know, it's a good time. Yeah, on a similar note, uh, I understand that there might be some college students on the call and just speaking uh, uh, statistically, I think there's gonna be multiple multiracial or biracial people listening in on this call. And that's a unique part of our community, right? Like. The fact is that for a lot of people, we saw the first big mass wave of Asian immigration in the late 1960s, 1970s, maybe the 1980s. And so as a community, we're in that sense, we are young um, and we're getting to that second, third generation and we're seeing cultural assimilation. We're seeing, uh, you know, intermarriage from different ethnicities. And so that's a very unique experience to be at. And then the question becomes, what does it mean to be, you know, a, a NHPI, right? And that's a complex question. I was talking with some CKA folks once and, you know, for me, like it was interesting being biracial, I'm Irish and Korean, right? Like, what does it mean to be Korean specifically or what does it mean to be Asian American? And uh, for me, it's, there's no checklist, right? There's no like, oh, if you like kimchi and K-pop and you watch the right K-dramas, like then you're Korean, right? Versus like if your mom's Korean, but you don't do any of those things and you don't count, right? And, and so in that sense, I think it goes back to what you were saying. It's important to show up. Uh, a line that I use a lot of times is if you don't put it on a team on the field, you always lose. Um, and so something that I think our community needs to also be thinking about is, um, and, and that's interesting is uh, identity politics is, is something that we're all part of. It's, it's part of our world today. It's something that we might have to do just to, to exist uh, peacefully. But at the same time, dividing by ethnic groups like as a breakdown, you know, that's a really interesting place to be. Because when I have kids, like let's say that they're Afro, Latino, Asian, white, like, you know, you have a finite amount of time. Which group do you join? Which which group decides to give you resources? Right. And so I think something that's really important that we need to be focusing on as well in building this community is that our ownership isn't just of APA America, our ownership is of America broadly. We're, you know, I for, I for one think that we have just as much right and access to the rights of American citizens as anybody else. And it's important that we're uh, establishing our ability to protect that access. And then also at the same time, making sure that what we're focusing on guaranteeing isn't just something for a small slice and it's a very specific solution, but something that broadly improves the rights and lives of everybody. And so I, I know I'm curious as the other panelists thought on that, because, you know, as time goes on, statistically, the, the fastest growing demographic in the United States, we say this a lot, is Asian Americans. And the fastest subgroup of Asian Americans is multiracial Asian Americans. And so, you know, I'm curious as to what people think that means for our community going forward, how that means as we kind of become more disparate. And yeah, just throwing that out there for discussion. I mean, I would say at APIPA specifically, we do not do cultural organizing. You know, we do not organize around cultural lines. We organize around power. 
because at the end of the day, we know that the lines are drawn, the lines are clear. We have a faction in this country that has spent the last couple of years talking about China virus, talking about kicking our folks out of the country, talking about Muslim bans, talking about like targeting our Cambodian communities for ICE raids. And then we have factions in this country that are willing to show up for our community and show up for our people. And at the end of the day, what we have seen time and time again is that when our people unite across lines of difference, including across racial lines, but especially in ways that shows our self-interest in ways that shows how we can actually unite and build power, which is the Pakistani family and the, the Bangladeshi family and the Indian family saying, hey, yeah, you know, our back home, our families have spent the last 60 years kind of sort of invading each other. But right now we all live in Delaware County, Pennsylvania, and we, we are dealing with these same language access issues. We're dealing with these same issues of discrimination. We're dealing with the same bricks through the windows and, you know, uh, the, the same Islamophobia, regardless of their actual religion, that we know that the only solution is come together and build power in a way that lifts all of our boats in a way that secures a political future for all of us. And so we don't, you know, we don't do the whole, oh yeah, you know, we all like rice. Oh yeah, some of us like bamboo. You know, we like these certain colors, things like that. For us, Asian Pacific Islander is a political identity, a, a sense of shared struggle and a commitment to being in solidarity with each other until we're all free. So just a quick follow-up if I may, June. So it's interesting to treat it as a political identity because how do you fit in people who have different politics but who are ethnically of the same group? We meet them where they're at and we organize them. You know, Asian American as a term was created by progressive and left anti-colonialist, anti-imperialist college students in the Bay Area in the 1960s. It was created as a political identity, has never been anything else. It's never been cultural. It's never been ethnic. It has always been about building a coalition to take on power and win justice for our families. And that is what it always will be. And that's how we, we got to move. That's how we got to organize. We got to dig deep. We got to meet our people where they're at in their hurt, in their pain, in their culture, but in their values, but in a way that moves them to where we know we need to be, need them to be. And uh, I'm gonna stop with my soapbox and give the floor to someone else. <laughs> no, I think this is good. Um, I don't think I've asked a question in like the last uh, 15 minutes, so I'm actually pretty happy. Um, Although I, Peter, at some point, I do want to talk to you about uh, being uh, uh, Korean Irish or Irish and Korean, because I did date someone with the last name McNeil, who uh, um, was probably like five foot one and drank me under the table. So we'll, we'll talk about that later, because that's a thing. <laughs> um, so moving on. Um, so that actually raises some interesting points, right? Like um, uh, being a, a, an HPI, being Asian American, being um, AAPI, like all these things are um, labels that are kind of placed on, on us, on our communities, et cetera, right? Like, so my family moved here in 1983, like growing up, my mom and dad always talked about the fact that we were Korean, right? And then at some point, like I um, accepted the fact that I may be Korean American, right? And then like, as I got older, like this whole concept of Asian American came in where um, that wasn't something that we talked about in our family, right? Um, so if these labels are placed upon our, our community from the outside, like, how do you actually represent, right? How do you actually like bring together um, different communities of color, right? Um, and have them, like Mohan said, meet us where we're at, right? Oh, wow. Someone just said they aren't 21 yet. Sorry, I'm just looking at the chat finally. Sorry, sorry Darren, but you know, we can talk about that too later. Yeah, June, I can, I can take that one. And I think um, 
I'm really glad that we're having this conversation because I do think when we think about our community, obviously AAPI is an all encompassing term, right? Like we're a monolith. And so a lot of times we have to lean into that when we're talking about wanting to be part of the conversations more fully, because I think if we just focus on ethnic specifics like that, and then that has a place, many times we're not invited to the table. It doesn't mean that we shouldn't be at the table, but there is a time and a place for us to be part of that, to lean into that monolith identity. But then I also feel like when we're at those tables, unpacking who we are and understanding the different ethnicities and languages that are all encompassed in that term is of the utmost importance. Because I think, um, so So I work very closely with Eric and Mohan. Um, They're both part of the Asian American Power Network. And so several of the calls that we have and things that we need to talk about are, how should we be thinking about ethnic, ethnic specific organizing? But the funny thing is there are some days when like on my WhatsApps, people are like, well, I'm, I'm, are we South Asian? Are we people of color? Like, what are we? So we're meeting people, I think, in both of those spaces at both of those times, um, really trying to unpack and understand who we are, but understanding the nuance, I think, as well, is, is where campaigns have traditionally overlooked us, is that we are painted with a broad brushstroke, um, doing work in language is extremely expensive. And so, you know, like, let's not invest our time and energy there. Well, that I think is like the wrong strategy. Um, and so I do feel like that has been one of the challenges. And I think, you know, June, you had asked that earlier. And so Jasmine, you know, I think really having our participation in those spaces is really, really critical. Um, at the national level, the Asian American Power Network was really created to make sure that the innovation strategy and understanding of who our communities are that are sourced and created on the ground do have a conduit up into the national level, right? When we're thinking about strategy, when we're thinking about policy, if you just say like Asian American, there's not enough understanding around who our community is. And so that's where and how we are intending to add nuance. I also think that when we talk about solidarity, and that really stood out in Mohan's last comment, was we need to be standing in solidarity together. So working across um, lines with the Black and Latinx communities is of the utmost importance. And I think it's really critical that we learn from their organizing strategies. Our experience, our culture, and our history is, it has not had the same trajectory as those two communities. Yes, we have been on the front lines of racism. We have. There have been policies, right, that have kept us out of places. So that is very real. How can we be in conversation with other communities about how they have built power in their, in their communities, how they are thinking about policy-oriented solutions? Um, one of the books that I have gone back to multiple times is actually The Purpose of Power by Alicia Garza, who was one of the founders of the Black Lives Matter movements, just to understand some of the policies um, and understand how the Black identity has been policed and vilified over the over the past well centuries right let's be honest about that but she really offered some insights around like how do you do community organizing why is it important and i think if we are not in those conversations at both the national level and in states in particular i think those learnings those opportunities for alliance and i think that the innovation that each of our communities have 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 um, cultivated those are conversations that we're not leaning into. So I do think that solidarity is the utmost important, I think, for us to build power, but also to learn what actually works in mobilizing our communities. And if I could just add to that, I know I took a lot of space earlier, sorry about that. But just emphasizing, you know, I think that there's a lot of, especially, you know, when I was coming up, a lot of hopelessness around the, the, the notion of Black Asian solidarity or APIs for Black lives or things like that. And in a lot of cases, we see, you know, mobilization after mobilization, you know, we have to turn out, we have to be in the streets, you know, we have to, to show up. And absolutely all of that is important. Showing up builds solidarity, showing up builds the struggle, showing up, at, uh, you know, builds our sense of what is possible. But we also have to bring it home and talk to our friends and family. And while absolutely certain communities, when you disaggregate the data, have a lot of work to do and a lot of conversations to be had, one thing that we see in Pennsylvania time and time and time again is that work works. That when you have these conversations in a way that meets our people where they're at, in a way that takes the time to explain these terms and concepts and history to our friends and family members and elders, they are with us. You know, When uh, Asian community organizations across the state have spent the last three years 
building a first of its kind policy agenda for APIs in Pennsylvania off 1500 conversations in 15 different languages with Asians and in, in, in Pacific Islanders across the Commonwealth of all immigration statuses, all languages, all uh, you know generations, et cetera, et cetera. If we went in uh, and we were just like, hey, what do you think about the Green New Deal? We would get a, a lot of people would be just like, huh, what's that? When we take the time to explain that in multiple languages in ways that our people understand, we get 84% of our community across the state saying, heck yeah, we want to just transition away from fossil fuels that creates good jobs in the process. Hell yeah, fossil fuel corporations are poisoning our environment, making the seas rise all across the world, and we need a radical reimagining uh, of the rules. We need to change the game to make, make a, a climate that is just, is equitable, is fair, and that works for all of us. You know, when we put in the time to have these conversations, do a lot of active listening, explain these terms to our family, it, it pays off. And I just want to really emphasize that. Uh, so, so how does that happen, right? Like, you know, I remember sitting at a, a very quiet dinner table uh, in my household because I grew up in a very like East Asian um uh, household where unless uh, I was asked a direct question or unless I was spoken to, like my parent, my my dad literally did not want me to talk, right? So there there is this cultural factor that um, plays into it for some of us, um, where we have to break through, right? That's where you know being Korean, being Chinese American, being you know Indian American, South Asian, like. There are these things that culturally um, politics does not always fit into, right? Like same thing goes for being of a certain certain gender in uh, the Asian American community, right? So who wants to take that one? I say no to Mohan and Nadia, by the way. I think for us, it's really interesting. I don't think the the very conventional wisdom on the progressive left or the conservative, the right fits into whenever we go into our community. I think one is because language. I think a lot of time the language loss in translation is one thing. Another thing is the home culture. A lot of time the home country, the country of origins, you know, our, our, our community, about half of them, more than half of them are first generation naturalized citizen, half of them are second, third generations, but still a lot of time the line cutting, for example, I organize a Taiwanese community, I talk to them, it's never about Democrats or Republicans who support Taiwanese more, but my job is to bring over it then why did you move here? Once that we are the voting block, I call the new American, the American dream voting block. You're here either while I'm honoring my parents' sacrifice or the grandparents or the people that made the journey. But that also means what bound us together is we are fighting for language justice. We're fighting for health equity. We're fighting for education equity. I go to my community, they're like, it's so easy. I think language and culture. And then the third thing I want to talk about is misinformation, disinformation. A lot of time when I go talking to uncles and aunties, they're just schooling me like, oh yeah, you're a nonprofit, probably George Soros and his dirty money funds you. I'm like, didn't I just help your wife uh, get naturalized? You think we do this for free? I'm like, no, the work, you, you're thinking about politics of punditry, um, whatever Fox News and MSNBC, the talking points that you hate the politics or you're like avoiding that dirty politics, that's to you. But we are on the ground every day. People need help. And we're there to make sure that we're dispelling that model minority myth. We're not letting our community be used as wedge issues from public safety to affirmative action for education, all these different things that we're doing. And I think it's not easy to just coin, oh, the progressive left or the conservative right. No, it's everyday people's lives. They moved here for a better future. And how do we meet them at this moment with all the circumstances? We talk about... Uh, clean energy, we talk about climate change with our own Asian American lens. We talk about reproductive justice because we know what it's like to be an Asian woman back home. My mom talked to, um, to me about that. My, my grandma talked to me about their relationship with the in-laws, the property of their family. 
a lot of things that it's not that easy to coin it. And a lot of times the white supremacy wants you to uphold it by making those issues like affirmative action is hurting Asians. No, it benefits so many of us that had made it this far. And the public safety, for example, the I, I don't want to get partisan, but we have a very strong talking points right now saying, oh, Democrats are in control of Nevada. So they will try to defund the police. That's why the crime is rising. And then we're like, no, that's talking points. We went in and say, we advocated for funding for police translators, but people are not filling those posts. We're not defunding the police. We give you the tools and resources you need to serve our community, but you're not meeting the community where they are. You're not serving the communities. It's not no longer, we go hold our elected officials accountable, no matter which parties they are. That's the grassroots. That's my identity. That's the advocacy. You make sure that resources are brought to the community. I serve my community the same way under the Trump administration, the same way I serve them under the Biden administration. The challenges are different. The resources are different. But every day, that's what building power, winning justice for our community looks like. And I'm going to hop off my little soapbox now. Thank you, Eric. Yeah, I, I, Eric, thanks for that well put point. I think uh, what's really interesting to look at with our community and specifically the Korean American community is I think it's a uh, it's a responsive instead of proactive community in a lot of ways. Like the awakening of the Korean American community as like a political concept. I think many would point to like Saigu, which is like the Korean, the LA riots um, where billions and billions of damage were done to the Korean American owned businesses that were in LA at the time. And what was interesting is that what happened was, is when the police were drawing the projective barrier, there was these crazy riots destroying businesses. When the police were drawing the barriers of what areas they would protect, they basically stopped right at Koreatown and said like anything beyond that line, we can't protect. And that's where you get like the rooftop Korean stories and the memes that have come out of that now um, and all those sorts of things. But um, learning about that and learning like that was the moment where he said if we're not out there advocating for ourselves like having the government say like that's an area that we need to protect as well the community doesn't get protected it doesn't get the resources it's need it's interesting you bring up affirmative action because i think a case that i've where i've seen a lot of asian american parents get involved is not just with the affirmative action at the university level but specifically with the modern magnet school uh admission policy and where we're moving from test-based systems to I think more holistic narrative application based systems and and that's an interesting transition going on and what i saw that was fascinating was when you see schools like thomas jefferson in virginia where i'm from um, that are almost majority asian american and communities are coming in saying it's too asian um, there's not enough of specific subgroups of people of color we need to change the admissions process and what's really sad is once they change the admission process they had a bunch of these and Asian American data engineer parents who came in and they crunched the numbers and they realized like the number one thing that would change when they changed the admissions process was not more uh, people of color. It, it increased the share of white people and decreased the share of Asian Americans. And, and so, um, you know, that's a whole specific sub policy point where you can get into the debates of that specific. But the point being is that I think our community has been when they feel problems that they feel real ownership owner, for example, education of their kids. Um, that really raises the stakes and makes people want to get involved. When they see their businesses getting burned down, that makes people want to get involved. Um, one that might be considered more progressive, like in New York, when you see the hate crimes against uh, elderly Asian folks, that makes people stand up and want to get involved. And so I think it's good to capitalize on um, the passion that we feel when these problems are arising, but also to continue. I think, you know, showing up is a consistent theme that, that we've been having in this conversation, showing up and making sure that we're organizing on, on these issues, even when there aren't these national headlines telling people like, oh, if you're Asian, you need to care right now. Like we need to care all the time. And I think a lot of people do, but but that's something I think we should focus on. And, and, and one final point, it's interesting just to note as well, uh, when we're talking about what does it mean to be Asian American and how do we engage with that broad community, it's really interesting to see how where each administration puts the White House initiative on AAPIs, right? So under Obama, it was under the Department of Education. Under Trump, it got moved to the Department of Treasury. And now I believe it's under the Department of Health and Human Services. And I think um, it's interesting because I think outsiders will place us and say Asian Americans will care about affirmative action. They might care about immigration and you know a handful of other issues and put us into a box. And again, like I think it has to be broader than that. And you know, to, to Mohan's point, it's 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 a broader movement um, where we have to be caring about all these different things, whether that's 
energy policy or labor policy. You know, Asian Americans are one of the largest owners of small businesses in the United States. It's a very common Asian story to say, like, my parents owned, a, my uncle owned a gas station, or my uncle owned a laundromat, or my aunt ran a small business. You know, and, and so that's something we need to be focused on as well. And those are issues that aren't even just tied to the Asian American community. Having a strong economy where people feel like they can have a job and provide for their family and take care of their children is something that means a lot to all Americans and and including Asian Americans. And so that's an area where it's interesting because that's not Asian American specific, but that's something that speaks a lot to Asian Americans. And so that's something I think that, again, is something we need to have a conversation about as a community as we go forward. As a, as a proud Marylander, um, I want to have a conversation with you now about growing up in Virginia. No judgment. I never used to go across the river until uh, I became older. Better, better Asian food there. Um, that's a uh, the, the Eric between you and uh, um, Peter. That, that that was uh some interesting points there. Like for me, I can say um, again, growing up in Maryland, completely completely far away from what was happening in Los Angeles when I was uh, in middle school, right? Um, I think I still have a stencil um, drawing that somebody in class gave me. Um, I actually, still remember her name. Believe it or not, um, that that said. Welcome to Los Angeles. It's a riot, right? And as a kid, like you don't, yes. Um, and as a kid, you don't actually realize what's going on. Having now lived in Los Angeles, um, I spent my uh, uh, mid twenties there. Uh, I would recommend that to a lot of folks on this call, um, even Darren, who's not twenty one yet. Um, once you become twenty one, Darren, you should uh, think about moving to LA. It's great. Um, you know. The, the interesting thing is my friends in Los Angeles who literally sat in their parents' cars, right, while their parents were driving to these stores um, in South LA, South Central LA, um, and in Koreatown, like, you know, some of the posts during the summer of uh, 2020 on Facebook, like, it actually got me, right? Like, they were actually piling on talking about how the reason that violence happens in certain communities is because of the fact that black people are killed by the police, right? They weren't talking about defunding the police, but they were acknowledging the fact that there was a problem, there was an issue, which I think also, um, you know, brings up the whole conversation again of where do we fit in? How do we fit into this uh, bigger narrative of what America is um, and how we, we bring other communities along, right? Like I have conversations now with um, some of my friends, like one of my good friends in New York, she runs uh, um, the Asian American Federation, right? Um, and Joanne and I talk about the fact that we see a lot of Asian hate crimes, right? And she acknowledges the fact that like, um, we need to invest more in mental health, right? That is why a lot of these things are happening. We need to invest more in media and representation of Asian Americans because, you know, those things also play into it. Yeah, Carmen, jo Joanne's like one of my really close friends. Plus she sends my daughter's uh, stuff. Um, so I see some questions. Uh, uh, and there was a question about NHPI, um, and Eric uh, answered it, um, but I think we should actually talk about it. So the question was, I want to recognize that we don't have an HPI presence on this panel. I am very sorry. I helped pull together this panel, and next, next year I will uh, definitely invite some of my NHPI friends. Um, if the panelists are familiar with their local NHPI communities, could they share how often and how many NHPI tend to be engaged with their work and what issues draw them in? Any specific things that you have learned about the NHPI community and if you do work with them? I'll jump in because I have to. I have the population outside uh, for uh, Las Vegas, especially for Clark County. It's the second largest county with NHPI population outside of Hawaii. So for us, uh, a lot of time it goes to speak to the panelists here, the attendees. A lot of time it's the pipeline. It's making sure we are. Uh, for me, I have folks, uh, the, the high school students, college students, we want to make sure 
that they become leaders that I want to make sure in 10 years they become uh, folks that they can that can be on this panel too. And I know they're amazing organization like Epic on the national level that uh, foster that NHPI leadership. So for us on the local level, I think it's it's it goes back to when we get started about how AA and HPI, the, the language has changed, but, but as a collective political term is when we need to build power uh, 40 years after Vincent Chin, no one's going to ask, are you a Japanese auto worker before they murder you when you're, you know, Vietnamese wearing Chinese. The same thing as the anti-Asian hate has been here for as long as this country exists. I'm in Reno where the Reno Chinatown was burned down because Asian carried disease a hundred years ago. There's a decree and there's a little plaque. And then the same thing with South Asian hate during the 9-11 time, they won't ask, they say stuff, they do stuff that still reverberate until today. It's anti-Asian hate is not new. And for us doing NHPI, it's a solidarity thing. And for solidarity, for political collective term and building power means a lot of time for us to support, fund, and resource the NHPI community that I have here in Las Vegas and, and also Nevada as a general. We talk, we have Samoan leaders on our advisory board. We have a lot of Shamoro. Uh, actually, my board chair is uh, uh, Shamoro from Guam. And then for us to it's support them with real actions. We do, our food bank has a specific NHPI uh, portion of it. Uh, we also know the family needs is different. We have uh, different ways to connect and fostering that small business. So we have uh, a lot of time. If you come to our event, you will get Hawaiian shave ice by NHPI small business owners. You will get red rice, which is amazing food from Guam, but it's also making sure for the leaders, you recognize them, you support them, grab resources, sponsor them. But then for the youth, I think that's an important part. That's why we're here because I'm here because 10 years ago, people invested in me. I'm here because 10 years ago when I was just out of college, June told me that this is community organizing, political organizing is a career. Every one of us, NHPI or East Asian, Southeast Asian, South Asian, we all have the same parents that care about what we do, that compare us to our cousins, that compare us to our peers and neighbors. So we want to make sure that we are a lot of, I, I'm able to do this work because June struggled it 20 years ago. He kept saying 20 years, but you know, I struggled 10 years ago to make sure that I can keep sticking on this. Of course, there's a lure for tech, uh, there's a lure for uh, finance. There's always, always people want us to be doctors and lawyers and engineers. And my grandma asked me that every time, but it's also making sure that we can live our truth and live to serve our community and making sure that the way, the path is there. So for us, uh, I think that's the best I can do as a non-NHPI is to support the resources that we can get and honoring their events and um, making sure that we're empowering the community leaders. And I think that's that's from me and from Vegas, that's a ninth island. Uh, that's what we can say. Wow, thanks for, uh, thanks for making fun of how old I am, Eric. I appreciate that. A uh, question from Darren Wong, who is uh, less than half my age. Um, what are things that bring you joy when working with your respective communities? Uh, first off, calling June old, it never, it, you know, never get tired of that. Darren, if you ever want a job, just, you know, phone banking June and reminding him that he's all our uncles, hit me up, just let me know. Um, you know, kind of going off what Eric was talking about around where, like how we need to serve our people, where we needed, you know, I'm going to assume that if you're on this call, you have some interest in politics, some interest in government, some interest in serving our people. And where we really need our people right now is in the states, in the field, and in the streets. You know, we have, we, we will always need people in government. We will always need people in think tanks. We will always need, always need people in big national organizations. But where we really, really need us right now is in Asian and API and A and NHPI organizations that are working year round on the ground, moving our people from where they are, mobilizing them, persuading them, turning them out, building long-term power for our people, because that's how we all get free. And, you know, getting to, to work at APIPA and spend every day doing that, and especially even something as simple as getting, getting to knock doors in our communities, in, in places like Philadelphia's Chinatown, in places like Washington Avenue in, in South Philly, which is where our Southeast Asian refugees were first resettled 
when, uh, you know, after the American invasion of Vietnam and Southeast Asia, uh, in, in a place where the government knew there was lead in the water and asbestos in the walls, and they dropped our communities there because they thought that we couldn't fight that. And our communities built community, built power, built art spaces, built cultural spaces, built supermarkets, and now those spaces are under attack by gentrifiers, by developers, by people who are, you know, want to displace or prey on our communities. And getting to spend every day talking to our people about how to fight back against that, getting to spend every day talking about candidates who are from our communities and actually understand what we've been through and what we need. And especially getting to see people, just people's faces as they actually, as you, as you talk about a vision for what political power means for our people. And as you see people every single day start to dream of a future in a, in a state, in a country that works for all of us, that I think is what gets all of us uh, up in the morning. And I think that's the best part of this job. Anybody else want to add to that? I'll chime in, June. Um, so when I think of community, right, I think of like the API community, but also the labor community. And two weeks into my job at SEIU, I attended what we call um, an activation at the Orlando airport where our airport workers were fighting for fair working conditions and fair wages and also to, you know, have safer working conditions, especially during the COVID pandemic that we're still in. Um, and you see these people who are working for just minimum wages, right? And, and doing the work that people just don't even think about how, how much it means to other people, right? Like pushing the wheelchairs of the elderly, right? Um, and they don't even get healthcare benefits because they're technically contracted workers. Um, and you think about how it, it, how it reminds you of your immigrant families um, and the, the childhood you, brought, you grew up in, right? And that just because these workers aren't all API um, or many of them probably aren't API, they share the same struggles um, that you grew up with and that you're fighting for a better country so that you know, all these people can have just better working conditions, right? We're not asking to be the next millionaires. We're just asking for people to have fair wages um, and, and health care, right? So that when they get to the hospital, they, they know they're not going to go bankrupt because of something they couldn't control. Um, so that's what really brings me joy in and um, what brings me out of bed every day to do the work that I do. Thank you add that I think one of the exciting parts of doing this job is like Mohan said right we want to find you in the streets we want to be on the doors with you all and I think one of the really exciting things about our network is being able to say we've got you covered right like because we're in our communities Mohan mentioned the phone bank happening in 15 different languages I'm from Colorado the API electorate is like less than two percent but to know that where the API community is there are organizations that can say we've got you covered we can help you with that um like you know if you've got a question let me answer it and there's I think a real sense of innovation that the groups have as well to meet the moment bring people into the process answer those questions and ultimately help Help them be part of the democratic process. I will also say um, in 2020, there was a mailer that went out in, in Georgia that was in Hindi. And I think for the individuals that received that piece of mail, while it was bilingual, for them to say, to see that someone took the time to think about their community, to like check the language, right? It wasn't Google Translate, but to really put some intentionality and thought behind the words, the language, and the framing that would make them be seen as a voter. I think those moments are the ones that we really hold on to and the ones that actually inspire us to go out and be part of those actions, like the ones James just mentioned or to sign up for a canvas and I also think there's a real value in that because I know my grandmother would love for me to be a lawyer she's asked like obviously I'm in my career I'm very happy but she always asked she said you don't want to be a lawyer and I said you know there's a there's a time and space for that but I think the work that we're doing is also really critical so you know that one size fits all for us I think we are um I think we should buck the stereotypes because obviously there's ample work to be done. And if it's not done by us, then who will do it, right? As a, the resident person working at a law firm for the summer, I do want to just say, um, no, more power to you there, Nadia. But, um, you know, there's- oh, no, I come from a family of lawyers, Peter. So like, this was a big kind of like step in a different direction. So 
Yeah. Lots of respect for the law, though. <laughs> no, no, but good for you for being able to, to stand up for yourself in that sense. Um, I, I think uh, to the audience, right, there's a, there's many different calls of it, to actions that you can get from this call. I think um, so there's an example of like pursue your dream. And if that's community organizing, definitely reach out to the people here. They're going to have much better advice for that uh, than I will, I think. Um, but what I would say is that also um, being active in your community is a full time job in the sense of like you're doing it regardless of whether or not you're like officially a community organizer and if that's your title with your job right and so for me, like my full time job right now is working at a law firm, but I want to because it's important to me to be active in my community I give back to you, Paul, and I've tried to be a PAC participant there and create community there. And so in your daily lives, when you're just reaching out to people and building community, whether that's with your church or with people at work or with people at school um, or people in your like cultural community, whatever that is, that is an important part of us claiming ownership and building the spaces where we can effectively understand what are the problems that are we're facing and then thinking creatively about how do we advocate for solutions and what do those solutions look like and so i would just say that you know it, it it's great to pursue this as a career i highly recommend again folks listen to the people on this call for that and at the same time if you're like man i actually want to go into banking or consulting or big law or tech or you know whatever million different things that you could do uh doctor i can't believe i forgot that one um but whatever million different things you could do like just keep in mind that where our community is and, and how, the different ways that you can give back, whether that's through mentorship, financial contributions, whatever. And so I would just encourage that perspective as well. Or you can be really, really lucky like this guy. And uh, my whole entire job is uh, working for the 28th largest uh, corporation in America doing community outreach and external affairs. <laughs> I like pointing that out sometimes. So funny story, since uh, um, we're getting towards the end of uh, our uh, our time. So uh, about, so my daughter is almost four now. She'll be four in September. Um, and like I said, I, for 21 years, my parents had no idea what I did for a living, right? Um, I, I lived in eight different states, uh, two different countries, always working in politics. Um, my, my mom and dad used to tell their friends that I worked for the Democratic Party and I have technically never actually worked for the DNC. Um, <clears throat> and one day, uh, my dad being a good Korean American was sitting there watching golf on a Sunday um, and uh, it was the Deloitte Classic. My brother-in-law is a managing director at Deloitte. Um, he runs one of their federal government affairs uh, or federal government like tech consulting uh, teams here in DC. So he's a, a quote unquote good Asian uh, working in IT, um, uh, et cetera. And my two and a half, my, my 75 year old father is telling my two and a half year old daughter, oh, that is the company that your uncle works for. And my daughter well, wa walks up to the TV. She's like slapping the TV. And the funny thing is, he was watching the Golf Channel, um, and my daughter is slapping the Comcast Peacock. Uh, because Comcast owns uh, the Golf Channel. And I say, I say to my dad or my daughter in Korean, oh, hey, look, uh, your dad works for the company right there that uh, owns the TV station um, or the cable channel. And my dad kind of looks at me, looks at my daughter, looks at uh, uh, my brother-in-law, Rich. And he's like, oh, yeah, yeah, your dad works for the company that owns the cable station. Um, so finally... I reached my life's goal, which was uh, my father actually understood what I did for a living. Um, I think uh, Hannah, oh, Hannah, so we'll respond to your questions after the discussion. Okay. So, um, you know, since I, since I told a funny story, um, what sort of fun do you guys have on campaigns? Uh, and Eric can kind of answer this, but not really, because he'll just talk about Boba and baby goats and BTS for those that are interested. Yeah, so this, I think the joy part, I, a lot of us share this is we get paid to do the things that we would do anyway for volunteering and uh, the bringing the authentic, what we enjoy. Uh, I like September, we have mooncake, moon festivals. Uh, we have baby goats for people's boats. We have puppies and boba. We do a lot of things that for K-pop, we were doing voter registration at the BTS concert uh, in Vegas. We're able to do a lot of different work 
uh, to to have uh, to get the community engaged. Not only engaged, it's not transactional. It's not cyclical. Cyclical in terms of it's the election cycle, win or lose you end. No, it's long term investment that builds that power from the community, but have some fun doing that. So for us hosting a giant Asian night market, uh, being able to get everyone to show up, folks, the, the feedback is, I did not know there's so many of us in, in uh, Las Vegas. When they say us, it's no longer Chinese people seeing other Chinese people. It's a broader community that people don't have the political term or terminology for it, but they feel empowered. They feel that they're part of something bigger, but still having something fun. And I think that for us, that brings true joy. And last thing I want to say is just a lot of food. We have the best food. That means I have some of the best Indian food. I have the best Thai food in Las Vegas because I go into the Thai temple and the uncles and auntie and the monks cook their own food and share with me. I have the best Sri Lankan food that you can buy in restaurants because I get invited into community members' places. The Spam Musubi, someone talked about NHPI. That's the local, uh, the local mobile that we have. Are not from are not store bought. This are community members when they open up, when you meet them where they are, when you are advocating for them, empowering them, they that's that's the that's the joy that we bring to to the work. So yeah. I think it's it's very rewarding and I would say fun to teach people about the democratic process. Um, when on all the campaigns I've done, I think a huge part of it has been education, like teaching people how to vote, um, teaching people that you can split your ballot in Texas. You can vote for Republicans for one thing and Democrats for the other. Um, you don't register with a party. And that was really rewarding, especially organizing in Asian communities because a lot of the people I met my age were very progressive and a lot of their parents were not. And so being able to explain to people that if you want a Republican this or that, you can vote for them. But if you feel a different way on a different issue, you can vote um, on the issues that you care about and, and vote with people that you think will do a good job um, in the role. And so that was one of the most fun and rewarding things was, was teaching people, sitting with people, showing them how, how to vote, how to get engaged. And then... I personally love um, knocking doors. I love block walking. I think that it is one of the most fun ways to organize. I think that you just meet so many people um, that you would never, never, literally never meet any other way. Um, so I'm a huge people person. Talking to people is my absolute favorite thing and learning what issues they care about um, and encouraging them as, as well as I can to engage in the political process because my biggest challenge was finding resistance. People were like, I don't want to do this. Like I, sh I just frankly do not want to vote. I don't want to do it. And so talking with them about the issues that they care about and explaining how, if you really, really care about our transportation system, you can just vote for the text off person. You don't have to vote for anything else. Um, and so meeting, it kind of goes back to just meeting people where they're at. Um, I find a lot of joy in that. Thanks, Jasmine. That's a that, that's an interesting point that Jasmine brings up. Like, you know, you guys have all talked about building power and doing grassroots, et cetera, right? Um, but if you don't vote, like, you don't actually build that, right? Because is there a way to actually check to see if someone's voted? Is there like, you know, how do you prove to an elected official that the community matters? I mean, I was planning on talking about the fun we have, but I can say, you know, we can, <laughs> like, we build power through telling, you know, going to an elected official and being like, hey, we have this many voters. And if you don't do what we tell you to do on this policy, we will endorse your opponent and vote you out. Or we can get the, uh, you know, 50 Asians outside your house at night with a bunch of signs and just make your life hell until you do what we tell you to do. And those folks don't all have to be voters. They just have to be, you know, it helps for them to be residents of the area. It helps to them for them to be residents of the district. But you are still impacted by our government and by our policies and by our, these systems, regardless of whether you're a citizen or not. And you deserve to be able to show up in the struggle and in the movement and in our civic process, even if you can't vote or, or frankly, you know, even if you choose not to vote, there are other ways to throw down. Voting is an important tool in our toolbox. It is a necessary tool in our toolbox. It's one of many. 
um, on the fun side, um, you know, we do, sorry, it was just, I'd much rather talk about uh, our have you eaten yet picnic. So we do have you eaten yet picnics uh, where we get a bunch of dim sum and pani puri together uh, at, you know, a park. And uh, we talk about democracy and the, you know, uh, attacks on our right to vote and things like that. Um, this isn't a fun story, but the fun, like the funniest thing that ever happened uh, in our, in our time at APIPA, it was like the week we launched our uh, field program in 2020, we were signing our people up to vote by mail and talking about how uh, Donald Trump was failing our communities by, uh, you know, uh, saying China virus all the time, you know, getting our people beat up in the streets, things like that. Um, and, you know, we, the first question on all of our scripts at the phone, at the doors, things like that, is what language do you want to have this conversation in? Because we know that 78% of our people speak a language other than English at home. And even if they're able to have the conversation in English, maybe they're more comfortable, maybe they're more going to, they're going to be more, more likely to open up if we offer language access in our, our programs. And we, we run our program in up to 15 different languages, depending on tactic. And so we had a, a Chinese elder who was talking to one of our phone bankers, you know, that, that question came up and she was up until that point, she was, she was mostly talking in Chinese and kind of like broken sounding English. And then the, the, the phone banker asked the question and she was like, oh, you know, uh, she said Chinese. And then she was like, wait, if I say Chinese, are you going to call me back in Mandarin? She said Mandarin actually. Uh, and the phone banker was like, yeah, of course, we want to talk to you. We want to include you in this process. You know, this is such an important election. And then she switched to perfect English and was like, <laughs> oh, <laughs> well, if you're going to call me back anyway, I guess I might as well have this conversation now. And I was like, y'all suck sometimes. Like, <laughs> our el so, like the, the biggest scammers in the community are some of our elders. And it is such a joy to be able to spend every day building power with them and turning all of, you know, turning all of that energy to, to good purposes. Pretend I don't speak English sometimes. Don't make fun of people. Okay. Um, Hey, so quick question, since we've been so serious this whole entire time, like, um, and I'm sure some of the folks here uh, would like to know, like, uh, any advice for young people who are currently on this call or will be watching this on YouTube, because this goes on YouTube, by the way, um, uh, on how to get involved in community organizing? If you're a young student or early career conservative Asian Pacific American professional or interested in learning more about the community, go to yapal.org. Uh, we built out a resource data bank that includes access to scholarships, internships, and other uh, government, public interest, community organization type uh, groups. And so just fill out our membership form and we'll be in touch. So that's, that's my plug for Yapal. Come on, do I have to go around the horn again? All right, Jasmine, you're under uh, Peter on my screen, so you can give a plug to Mosaic. Yeah, definitely. Um, before I give a plug to Mosaic, well, I wanted to share what I did because I loved my path to um, organizing. So what I did when I was a student is I reached out to my city council and we had um, an Asian mayor at the time and it was just important to me to figure out how I could get involved, whether it's volunteering on the campaign level or going to like grassroots events um, just to get the community out there and engaged um, or just together. Like a lot of times it was just parties, like it was just neighborhood block parties, which was super fun. So um, I would definitely see who your elected officials are. I loved working for elected officials. I interned um, at the Texas Capitol and then loved it so much that I stayed, um, especially if you have a large Asian community, um, being able to intern for your member uh, and serve the people that you live amongst and also like really be able to serve them, really be able to move mountains for them is so, so rewarding and was my favorite. Uh, was, it was the way I got into politics and organizing and I'm very glad that that was my path. And now being at Mosaic, um, you know, we are on Twitter at Mosaic at PPI. Um, so, we, we work with experts. So I know a lot of y'all being students are not necessarily experts yet, but we host a lot of workshops on development. Um, I think a lot of it is more professional development, but we always have opportunities for you to engage on policy issues that you care about. So 
if you care about crypto, which is a very hot topic that we will not unpack here, but we had a panel on cryptocurrency. Um, so we are always doing policy specific uh, events with the women of Mosaic. So bringing those experts in and then just having access to these powerful women um, and being able to kind of form relationships um, and mentorships with them is always something that they're interested in, in offering and always something that I think um, is, it's a great opportunity uh, to get to Washington as well. So check us out on Twitter um, specifically, we're very active on there. Um, I'll take a page out of Jasmine's book. Um, I mentioned that I'm from Colorado, so there are not a lot of women of color or women involved in the political space here. So there was really a, a, a candidate pipeline issue that my mom actually tried to step in to address. And she ran um, in September 2001. Her maiden name is Sharif. And so because of xenophobia, she lost her campaign. Um, but I will say that was my first foray into the political process and understood that representation, participation, and without really a, an invitation, I wasn't going to be involved in that process. And so I think early on, I really like clung to that and it's informed a lot of what I've done. Um, I also interned in high school in the state legislature, and that's really um, a space where I was able to see the interactions between issues and policy and where they do, where they overlap and how issue advocacy groups, how, how voters really can inform the policies, talk about the pros, cons, and impacts. And so that I think, you know, after working on campaigns, being on the hard side and just understanding kind of the limitations of sometimes what candidates can do, but understanding that issues will always mobilize individuals is really kind of how I have ended up in this space. And that's why the Asian American Power Network is of particular importance. It is because it is these we are representing groups that are on the ground in um, 11 different states with 10 different organizations um, that are doing year round organizing. So if you want to look us up, we're at the Asian American or AA Power Network. Um, you'll see our map. I am sure that we are active in your state. Um, Eric is on from Nevada. Mohan is on from Pennsylvania. So we're active in all of these different states, 365 days a year, we are looking for canvassers, organizers, and really we want to bring you all in, educate you, and help you become the next class of leaders in our community. So there is a real intention for us um, in turning out our community, but also building internally um, the, the, our own set of candidates um, and practitioners as well. So that's, that's us, A Power Network. Great. Uh, Hannah, Tokwe. Are you guys still there? Because I'm getting there. hungry. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Jasmine, James, Eric, Nadia, Mohan, Peter, and of course, you, June, our 2013 Kapal Senior Advisor for your thoughtful conversation this evening. And thank you to everyone for joining us tonight. You know, we started off this, um, this session hoping to discuss topics including identity building, community outreach, and empowering oneself to take the first step to make an impact, and you covered it all. And it was very clear that your passion and dedication that you each have um, really show in your work. Um, so thank you. And, you know, I'm just so moved that you're, you know, you're doing the work advancing multiracial democracy, increasing access to equitable resources, really reshaping the narrative for a much needed transformative cultural shift. So applause to, to our panel. And to everyone currently watching or streaming later, if you enjoyed this event, please visit our website for more information and upcoming events with Kapa. Also be sure to follow us on social media to learn more about our SNI and programs at Kapa DC. Also, I want to do a plug for Kapal. Kapal is looking for board members for 2022 to 2025 term. So please visit our website for the application and also full details. And finally, thank you to our 2022 sponsor for this continued support for our programs and for making opportunities like this possible. Thank you, everyone. And I hope you have a great summer and have a good evening. And we can stay on to take another photo if, if everyone's up for it before we sign off.